The working world is open like never before, collaborating constantly across countless platforms at the intersection of communications, people, and data. The solution? Work Protected. Work Protected enables you with a security solution that connects all the dots. One partner, integrated, intelligent, and intuitive. Mimecast. Work Protected with intelligent email and collaboration security only from Mimecast. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Mimecast to learn more. According to the 2022 Data Breach Investigations Report, 82% of breaches involve the human element. Yet most security awareness and training programs focus on compliance requirements, not the risk humans pose to your organization. Living Security is the leader in human risk management. This new approach transforms human risk into proactive defense by quantifying human risk. By understanding your riskiest and most vigilant users and activities, you can engage these segments of your workforce with relevant training, communications, and policies to truly change their behaviors. If your goal is to finally change your workforce's behavior, visit securityweekly.com forward slash living security to learn more today. The shift to remote and hybrid work over the past two years has accelerated application development on cloud infrastructure. However, securing these new assets has lagged behind. Qualys CloudView, the next generation cloud security posture management, delivers an end-to-end multi-cloud security and compliance solution encompassing the entire application lifecycle from build to runtime. CloudView enables enterprises to assess their cloud security and compliance posture, identify risks and gaps, auto-remediate issues, proactively enforce best practices, improve compliance and audits rapidly and efficiently. Identify your most vulnerable cloud assets by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash Qualys. It's time to rethink how we approach cybersecurity because the reality is modern cyber attackers are already past your initial defenses. ExtraHop helps your security team find and eradicate advanced threats before real damage is done. Protect your enterprise and customers with better defense. Learn more about how ExtraHop stops advanced threats at securityweekly.com forward slash ExtraHop. That's Extra H-O-P. Welcome back to Business Security Weekly. I am your host, Matt Alderman, joined by Jason Albuquerque and Tyler Robinson in studio. Don't forget to check out our library of on-demand webcasts and technical trainings by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash on-demand. All right, gentlemen. Time for the article segment, but um, I, I just wanted to say again, it is so, it's, it's so, so good to be here. It's so good to be here. <laughs> like, I love you guys. And, and it's funny <laughs> because we've been using Riverside for the shows. Yeah. I, I didn't realize that six of the seven commercials actually have my voice. It's yeah. just the original extra yeah. hop commercial that that does it. And I was awesome. like, oh my gosh, yeah, I forgot That's I recorded great. all those. It was good. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> Because they it. always get put in post right. edit anyway. So, so Matt, I'm going to ask you a favor. Because tonight, my Patriots need some luck. Okay. Because if we don't win tonight against the Cardinals, we're not going to make the wild oh, card. Oh. We're out. We're out. Well, I, I I know my Browns are out. My yeah. my Broncos are way out. Like, oh my gosh, I I watched that game on the plane last night, and I'm mm-hmm. just like, Renee said it. My ex, my daughter said it. Yeah. Right? She's like. Yeah, until he can prove himself, I'm, I'm, you know, she just wasn't high on the the Broncos. She yeah. was so right. Right. Oh my God. And then, holy crap, Tom Brady getting pummeled oh. by San Francisco with their third string quarterback. I know. Wow. I know the Bucks this did not been, look good it's, yesterday. It's one hell of a season, though. This has been a great season to watch football. So it has. Well, especially if you're up in the north. You know, Philadelphia has been playing really well. Yeah, yeah. The Giants have had a pretty good team. Mm-hmm. I mean, the Cowboys are doing well, even though I don't consider myself a Cowboys <laughs> fan yet. But um, yeah, it's it's been fun to watch um, for sure. And then those taters, those taters are doing great. Spuds. Man, the, the spuds, <laughs> the spuds, they're in the running. They're in the running. <laughs> All right, let's get into articles. Yeah, so I pulled in this first article from Jim Rivas, um, and the the title of the article is "Ceases of the World Unite," mm-hmm. and it is. I, I thought he did a really great job yeah. on the whole impact of the Joe Sullivan yep. um, conviction, et cetera. And, and really calling arms to all the CISOs to unite around making sure CISOs are protected. Yeah. Right. And, and I, you know, I, we've covered, you know, I covered the story the first week it came out with the original mm-hmm. conviction. And there's been a couple really powerful articles since that mm-hmm. we've covered on the show. And I, I thought Jim did a really awesome job. Yeah. Totally. Kind of like 
kind of a call to arms for mm -hmm. the CISOs yeah. to really unite around. Yeah, and I this. mean, called out the question right away, why is the CISO the only scapegoat here, right? Mm -hmm. Why aren't there other executives who, who uh, you know, should be responsible and should be held accountable for this? Why, why isn't there a conversation around that going on right now? You know, he, he did call out that, you know, he's not a big fan of, you know, let's send a message type criminal yeah. cases. Right. But at the end of the day, it's a necessary evil. That's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you have some type of a, a, a large criminal case, they're going to try to set an example. I mean, yeah. what would we be thinking about if it was a cyber criminal, a threat actor that was sitting on the stand right there? We'd be saying, make an example of them, right? So it's it's a necessary evil that happens. It's unfortunate. Right. But at the end of the day, we have to know it's a necessary evil. That being said, we need to stand up. We really, really do and, and, and advocate and evangelize for executives being responsible, not mm -hmm. just the CISO. Yeah, okay. it's, it, it's the entire executive team. Yes. It should be the entire executive mm -hmm. team at the end of the day. Yep. This is the thing that sarbanes actually changed, at least at the CEO and the CFO mm -hmm. level. Is this the event that changes that same behavior for the top security executive in the organization? Right. Right. I, I hope so, mm -hmm. Jason, as we've talked Agreed. about. I, I truly do hope so. But, but these are decisions that are made at an executive and or a board level. And he has a really great statement here in the end is that if, if it's, if this, if this, if it's not the CEO, mm -hmm. then this, this needs to be relegated to the board. 100%. Like, yeah. It, it, I mean, it was a really bold, interesting mm -hmm. statement at the end, which I'm like, well, yeah, that's actually a very interesting way to think it. If the CEO is not going to take some level of responsibility for security, then give it to the entire board of directors. Yeah, yeah, and, and I couldn't agree more. I was actually going to call out that statement as well. Yeah. That if if executives are going to take a stand and step back and say, I'm not going to be accountable for this, your CEO, your CFO, CIO, all of those involved in those decisions, those risk decisions for the organization, they're not going to be accountable for it. You know what? Take them out of the loop, make the board of directors accountable for it at the end of the day. Yeah, it's, it is wild that they're not, this isn't more the norm with mm -hmm. the decisions because the C, at the end of the day, the, the CISO is not the one that has the budgetary control. He's nope. not the one making all of the business risk decisions. Mm -hmm. And yet we still have the single point of failure for mm -hmm. that scapegoat. I think that is, that is something that we're also relying on the regular general public to understand the nuances of a CISO's role, right. what the businesses are up against from a business risk decision. Like, yeah, why don't you have all these security controls? Why did you get breached? Like, mm -hmm. there's a lot that goes into that. Like, maybe you didn't have discretionary budget. Maybe mm -hmm. you weren't provided the resources. But the the people making the jury and making the decisions around this really need to have that clear, full picture. And I think that's going to be something that becomes more and more important is uh, having the general public understand why this is such a big issue, not just, hey, they were breached, they yep. should be liable. Yeah, and, and the one thing that stands out to me is, you know, I haven't seen any of the paperwork or communications, but to think that legal counsel wasn't involved in some of the decision making? That's why. Uh, uh, highly unlikely, right? Highly yeah. unlikely that there wasn't some level of legal counsel involvement. So where's the accountability there? Did they have on staff legal counsel? Are they outsourcing it? There's a level of accountability because you know mm -hmm. there were legal decisions that were being made at sitting at that executive table. There's Absolutely. no GC on the planet that's going to sign off on that without being involved in it. Right. Exactly. It. Right. Right. And that's why I don't think it, it falling on the CISO role mm -hmm. is right when my guess is there were a lot of people in that decision making process. Yep. Yeah. Agreed. For sure. So, yeah, I mean, the moral of the story is 100% we need to, you know, as leaders within this in, in this industry and, and with that level of accountability, we do need to stand up and, and, and support them and support the cause. I mean, I know I know the author mentioned that they wrote a letter and sent it in. I mean, yep. you know, if there's things that we can be doing to evangelize, I mean, this podcast is one of them. We are evangelizing for this, right? Yeah. So uh, at the end of the day, let's, you know, let's roll up our sleeves and, and start supporting our, our people. Keep yeah. doing your job, Jason. That's right. <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's right. Uh, next story. Uh, this was a, uh, I think it was a Wall Street Journal panel. Um, yeah, Wall Street Journal panel discussing discussing uh, managing cybersecurity in a downturn, yep. right? Because we're there, right? We talked a little bit about it on the last segment mm -hmm. and, and some of the impacts there. And look, we, we know the challenges, I think, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're facing some headwinds in the market. We're facing uh, a skills gap shortage, mm -hmm. a retention issue. Inflation through the roof. Inflation yes. through the roof. Um, limited, you know, changes in valuations mm -hmm. on investments, right, are, are all happening at the same yep. time. And, 
you know, this panel kind of gets into some of the issues about, you know, how to prioritize mm -hmm. based on risk quantification. And, and I sit back in the role that I'm in now and think about, okay, I, I hear you. But how many organizations truly understand the risk impact yep. of the decisions they have to make in their budgets? Mm -hmm. Like, do they truly have an understanding of the risk impact? Mm -hmm. Because maybe... If, okay, I've got an integrated risk management solution and, and, and maybe, but when was the last time you did your self-assessment questionnaire sure. to identify, is it up to date? Like, mm -hmm. I, I just think about this whole concept of risk quantification. How many people right. have kind of their finger on the pulse of where risks are right yeah. now and how do I adjust my budgets to those? Sure. And I mean, you can, you can ask one question. When's the last time you did a business impact analysis? Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. if, if the answer to that is two years ago, oh my God, <laughs> you're, you're in trouble. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, we know that in, in budget years where there's going to be financial constraints, there's certain things that executive teams are going to target. They're going to target training. They're going to target bonuses. They're going to target incentive compensation. They're going to look to outsourcing. Mm -hmm. They're going to look for all of these different methods yeah. to trim down the budget. So we as, as leaders in the organization need to bring our A game and, and get ahead of that and say, here are the risks if you start cutting these things, if you start trimming down. And if you can get ahead of that and you can actually make the case, the investments will stay. Yeah. But, but that also means you have to have a good picture of what those risks yes. are. And I think yes. 100%. the more, the more you, you dive into this mm -hmm. and you can see the mature organizations, the more you know and the more you learn and have a better picture, the more you realize you don't know. Mm -hmm. you, you realize you need more quantifications. You need yep. those metrics in order to understand what those risks are because the people that are saying they're in a good position and the people that have the, the insights and they think they're doing a good job, those are typically the ones that are getting breached because they just don't know what they don't mm -hmm. know. That right. naivete is, is just... Right. Uh, it's a crippling and debilitating thing for an organization, especially when they get breached. Yeah. yeah. And that's why it's so interesting to think about the history of, of living security and, and why they started with the integration of the data and the, the, and the quantification engine itself, mm -hmm. right? Because they wanted a way to scale it, but to make it as real time as possible. And I think if you are doing a good job of risk quantification, you are uh, correlating data across all the inputs that are available to you in a near real time. It doesn't have to be mm -hmm. to the minute, but it's got to be daily yeah. as risks shift to know where those pockets are and how many people are really doing near time risk analysis through data integration mm -hmm. of all the different tools that they have. And, and I think this talks a little bit about um, risk lens and the fair model uh, mm -hmm. in the article as well, which I, I'm, I, I get, right. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great model, but if, if, if I'm only doing this on a quarterly basis, Jason, do right. I really know no. what the right next no, moves it's, are? No, it's all lag measures that you're yeah. looking at. If you're doing mm -hmm. it quarterly, it's lag measures. And you, and you know, because uh -huh. we've talked about this for four years now, I'm a lead measures type of person. Right. Get ahead of it so yeah. you can get in front of it, right? And, and because, because we talked about the detection and response piece in the email security side. But that's, that's after the fact sure. in some respects, right? And so if we're only leveraging our detection and response capabilities, mm -hmm. do we have enough leading signals on the preventative side to know that there's potential events coming down the road? And we're going to get into this later, but this yeah. is all of the say, easy, do hard stuff, yeah. right? It's yeah. easy to go buy blinky lights. It's easy to go buy tools. It's easy to go buy technologies. What's hard is to know what you have, know the risks, classify those risks, be able to articulate that. Mm -hmm adopt 80% of the capabilities of the tools you're spending money on. It, those are the hard things to do. Well, it's the integration of that too, yeah. right? Like mm -hmm. you look at that, that threat intel, you get that, that pointy edge of the spear, you get the, the real-time lead TTPs, all the latest stuff. Mm -hmm. What is that being fed into? How are those being reacted on? And, and right. if they are being reacted on, how relevant are they based on how new they are? If you're only doing mm -hmm. this quarterly, like the signals from three months ago, they're... Sure basically meaningless yes you need to prevent against them but now you're not doing active response you're not being proactive yeah. you're just being reactive to what was happening right. three to six months ago and then what's the quality of the response because you yeah. always want yeah. to continuously improve on top of yeah, that right. you need to be able to look at the quality if you did respond you right. need to, respond. Need to right. take a look at the quality of the response they, and you may need to go back and respond to something you didn't respond to three months right. ago right yeah right and and was the response effective or not effective yeah. right because if it happens again, do I do the same response or do I do something different? Like these are the, yeah. This these is the maturity that I think 
products are are having to start to get to that bar because we mm. need to be there. However, I don't think most products are thinking in this metric, in this qualitative manner. Right. This is something yeah. that is very, very bleeding edge from a quality standpoint. And this is where you're going to see a lot of the, the companies stand out when the, the budget cuts start to happen. You're going to see the ones that are actually measuring and doing effective measurements and showing their value in a qualitative budget manner for mm -hmm. the executive board. And then spending that budget wisely. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's you know, the execution of that budget is key. Yeah. You, it, I've noticed lately a lot of people talking about an analytics platform, but not necessarily a risk analytics platform, <laughs> right? And and they're different, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because we can measure threats and vulnerabilities all day long, but if we don't understand the impact in those equations, mm -hmm. we don't really understand where those risk pockets are. And that's right. the interesting part of where, where things are. Uh, this next article, things to consider amid cybersecurity vendor layoffs. And, you know, they, they, there's eight points here to think about when you're thinking about your budget, you're thinking about your vendor consolidation, because there's been a lot of layoffs in the news. And, and you know, I, I applaud Adrian for this, right, on ESW. They, they, they're actually tracking these layoffs in the enterprise security news segment. And so I've started to bring that into the security money segment yeah. uh, on this show because there are some major layoffs happening. And the question becomes, what does that mean to things like vendor communication and support and other things that if I'm going to move forward with that vendor, am I still going to get the same level of service yeah, or, right. or am I not? And so this article tries to articulate some of those areas that CISOs and, and other people in the security uh, industry should be thinking yeah. about. And, and just to kind of take a step back, the stats that are in there are staggering. A thousand rounds of layoffs, 2022, thousand rounds of layoffs, 182,000 people affected. Wow. How are we short on cybersecurity people and we're laying all of these people off? Like, where are they... Uh, what yeah. is happening? So you think about this. Right. The last stat I saw was like 770,000 yeah. open cybersecurity job openings right now. And then mm -hmm. we just laid off 182,000. So yeah, right. we should be down to like 600,000, right? I mean, yeah. under 600,000? That's what you'd <laughs> think. You would think. I think the unintended consequence that many executives at these vendors are not thinking about is things I'm thinking about when I look and see a company lay people off and then outsource those functions. Mm -hmm. I've now lost a little bit of, uh, I will say, trust in their ability to A, manage a business, B, be able to correlate and handle the things that I need them to do, and the training and quality at which I expect their product to deliver and perform. I'm now questioning that. Whether or not it's better or worse, yeah. that is yet to be determined. Sure. Yeah. But I am questioning that as I'm making, and not only that, business to business and integration. I would also be looking at and considering maybe I don't want to partner with this company now and do an integration mm -hmm. because of what I'm seeing from this. So mm -hmm. these unintended consequences of optics from a, an executive standpoint, yeah. you really have to be very careful about how you're doing this and proceeding. 100%. Oh, yeah. And that, I mean, that's what's going to drive these very important conversations that you need to have yeah, with your yeah. vendor, right? Yeah. Um, because that trust factor is eroded right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. As soon as you see that, all of a sudden, I mean, this is what we do for a living. We question yeah. things, right? I mean, right. So, so we're going to challenge that and we're going to ask the why. And even good companies. Like I, yeah, I'm asking some very, very specific 100%. questions on why some of these companies that have been doing well for so long yeah. now all of a sudden you've not set yourself up or are you mm -hmm. uh, overstaffed? Like what mm -hmm. was the problem here? Yeah, and, and you mentioned it earlier. It's not just being able to support the service level, but it's the quality of the service they're delivering on top of it. Big important right? point. Because they can deliver to an SLA, yeah. but what's the quality that comes out of that? Yeah. yeah. I, this one around... What security service, um, uh, no, it's the, the, the back to the why. Mm -hmm. What is driving the vendor's layoffs? Yeah. And if you think about some of the big ones in the news, it was all about cash burn. It was mm -hmm. all yeah. about protecting the investment. And I think as a CISO looking at some of these going, is that company going to survive? Yeah. Like, yeah. will they survive right, right. in this downturn? Right. Not a lot of people, Jason, have gone through multiple downturns. Mm -hmm. This is my fourth in my career. Mm -hmm. Right. We were, we were going through them the other day. Yep. I remember coming out of the 93, 94 downturn. I remember coming out of the 2000 dot com bubble in 01. I, I remember was just getting into the industry. Right. right around oh, yep. <laughs> I remember coming out of 08 into 09. Yep. Right. But we've had pretty much unfettered growth. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Since 2009. Right. Yep. And a lot of people who are new to this industry have <laughs> never, they, they've never been mm -hmm. through one of these downturns. 
And there's some lessons to learn out of this is yeah. that it's not always about top line growth mm -hmm. when you're in a recession and you know, how many vendors got a little too top heavy, yep. um, trying to deliver without understanding profitability and what the business ultimately needs, which is you need money That's and investment and cash, it. right? Yeah. And, and Matt, to that point, one of the, one of the statements I pulled out of this article that I wanted to kind of hone in on a little bit was there's a statement in there that said, you know, as long as they're showing revenue growth, there's a lot of venture, venture funding still available. Yeah. Well, if our interview with Robert Herjavec said mm -hmm. anything, not true anymore. Correct. Right? Because now it's all about your path to profitability. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. EBITDA, I, you have to have those deeper conversations. Absolutely. And I see that in, in the businesses I'm talking mm -hmm. to. It is about profitability mm -hmm. and getting there. I mean, it was something that Paul and I focused on very early on when I came over here in, in 2018 right, was get the profit, get the business profitable that's right. so that we had long-term growth. And, and that's what we did. We, 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 we focused on those things mm -hmm. and, and we were small. I mean, we were what, eight people. We were, we were doing yeah. this every single day. You right. know, I, I remember doing four podcasts a week and <laughs> not only get to do one, but we focused on it earlier and, and, and it worked for us, right? It was a very good outcome for, for us, the security weekly team when we did this, but People forgot about that yeah, a little bit. And then yeah. people have forgotten about well, the that's profitability the long term, The long-term and mature CISOs, you'll start to see that distingu the, the, the distinction between someone that's been through a few of these recessions that knows how to manage a company through yeah. them. You'll yeah. start to see that long-term sustained viability and getting to that point where profit matters and the optics matter yeah. and this is a long-term strategy. Rather than playing the checkers game, mm -hmm. you're playing the chess game and that sometimes requires you to move pawns around and take a hit in yeah. certain areas. Yep. Yeah, and I mean, the, the moral of the story is as a CISO, if you know that there's layoffs happening with your vendors, sit down and have that strategic conversation and say, where are you making the cuts? How are the, where are those cuts happening, right? So you can understand where it's gonna affect. Is it in your engineering team, your development team, or is it maybe your sales mar and marketing, your hopefully. marketing team, right? <laughs> is it your yeah, marketing right. team that you're gonna outsource some, some yeah. functions exactly to, right? right. It's, it's important to know where it's gonna affect you, and then you can have that deeper level conversation to know how it's going to come back to you as a customer of that business. Yeah. That risk that it may bring on to yep. your organization. Absolutely. Uh, these last articles kind of put us back into more of the leadership communication mm -hmm. side a little bit. Uh, this next article, why you need to write things down. I love this article. Um, me too. People who uh, me too. know me and my wife yells at me for this still to this day. I write everything down. I have my composition <laughs> notebooks. I'm a huge note taker. I draw pictures. I have all of my composition notebooks back to 2009 when I joined Koalas. I have them and they're all in order. Yeah. And she's like, why do you have them? I'm like, my entire history of being in the product world is in those books. Like I write everything down and I use that as a way to help me really identify what's in my important action items are. So I stay mm -hmm. focused, Yep. right? And I love this article because a lot of people just, they don't write it down, Jason. No, no. and then they're flying by the seat of their pants. So I learned very early in school, and this is like middle school, high school, that if I wrote things down, I remembered them. Yep. Mm -hmm. To the point where in high school, my father would look at me and be like, why didn't you bring any books home? And I said, I wrote everything down in class. Everything that the teacher wrote on the board, mm -hmm. everything that they projected and put up there for us, yep. I wrote down. Yeah. And I would do well on my tests. Yeah. And I wouldn't really have to study much, right? Because it helped me with my memory. Right. I'm going to I'm going to open it up to here. I I don't have a physical notebook, but I've been using OneNote for one hell of a long time. Yeah. Tyler can look at this Oh time. man. I mean, this is my OneNote and it goes back well over a decade. I mean, look Oh at yes. That. Yeah. See, and I I I don't think I think there's a dying art. Like you start to see some of the kids and you know, they've got the computers, they've got everything yep. on yep. their Google Drive, they do the school through, you know, whatever app yep. they do. The art of writing stuff down is a little bit lost, but man, mm -hmm. at, at one point when I was traveling doing this, I had four or five notebooks in my backpack. I had more notebooks and weight in my backpack from notebooks just yeah. because of you always have yep. to have that info. Now you've got digital, you've got the ability to write stuff down. You mm -hmm. know, I, I travel with a paper notebook. I do too. Digital. Yep. And literally you look back at that allows you to qualify the things that were important at a particular point in time, yep. measure yourself at what you've learned from that time, and often I'll find nuggets within inside of those notebooks that provide insight to today's current, you know, economic downturn, mm -hmm. a lesson I learned that I forgot about, <clears throat> or an idea that actually is more applicable now 
that would be lost forever if it was not written down. Yeah. And I, I, can't, I can't tell you how many times that has made the difference in, in a career that people just, that's a lost 100%, 100%. art. 100%. And Ta it's important. Tyler, look at, look at that date. This is, this is one of the first BSWs I was in. Uh, look oh at that my date. Gosh. 2017. <laughs> 2017 in my OneNote. And right it's here. right in the... <laughs> it's in my BSW. <laughs> it's a, that's impressive. Awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. I remember when I was in college, I had these notebooks for all my that. classes. Jason, back to your point around school. And all my fraternity brothers that came in after me would yeah. use my notes. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Because oh, yeah. You're a gold mine if you take notes, Oh, my man. God. <laughs> Those notebooks were used for years yeah. after I left because the classes were 100%. exactly the same. I, I, oh, yeah. I've had colleagues. I've had colleagues when we're sitting there trying to make a decision and people will be like, what did we talk about mm -hmm. a year and a half ago during this session? Blah, blah. Give me two minutes. And literally, I'm a brrrr. And I go find the notes because... I, and, and I'll warn people up front, if it's an important meeting, listen, don't mind that I'm clickety clacking during the meeting. I right. swear I'm paying attention to you. <laughs> I'm just, I'm taking notes because I know someday we're going to need it. We're going to need to go back to this. Someday. Yeah. The biggest reason I don't use electronics is number one, I'm a horrible typer. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been in this industry for a long time and mm -hmm. I, I'm a horrible typer. I'll tell you right no, now. Weakness. I, it's all good. I, I, I <laughs> hunt and pack, right? I know my weakness <laughs> and I can't draw electronically. Because I will oh, literally yeah, draw pictures, yeah, yeah. right? And yep. and I'll uh, yeah, sure. and like flow diagrams. That's and why stuff. Microsoft Whiteboard is awesome. Like yeah. I love yeah. the Whiteboard, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna feel like paper though. Yeah, exactly. I like paper. I'm old school. Mm -hmm. I am old school. Uh, the best public speakers put the audience first. Mm -hmm. You don't say. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Huh. You, you know what I love that the author called out here though is that that servant leadership. Because you know that's my mantra all the yep, time, right? And, and, you know, taking it all the way to when you're speaking, doing public speaking, having that mm -hmm. servant leadership mentality yeah. is so important. And, and just reading it and connecting the dots to how important it is for public speaking, yep. not just your leadership role. Yep. A, you know, this, this article is great. Absolutely loved it. Yeah. And I remember, you know, I haven't done this in a while. I haven't keynoted anything in a while. But I remember getting ready for my RSA keynotes mm -hmm. over in Singapore and Abu Dhabi and e even the one I did here in the US, I, I, I remember thinking about the message I wanted to get to the audience yeah. and connecting it with the audience. It's more than just a presentation. Mm -hmm. You have to understand when you're overseas, for example, like you have to understand culture yes. and how do you tie in cultural elements into a presentation so it mm -hmm. kind of hits home jason yeah, yeah. and I, I remember the first thing i would do is kind of visualize what i wanted to talk about mm -hmm. that became my slides for the talk track to really make sure i was connecting with the audience yep. in those conversations uh so I, I thought this was a really great article on presentation skills and 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 what it takes to be a really good yeah, and, 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 and public the part, speaker the part of the article i love the most was your ability to spin on a dime and then have a little bit of empathy because the story was she was part of this whole track of speakers. Mm -hmm. Everybody was running super late and it got to the point where she realized, you know, the pitchforks were going to come out because the audience was just going to get so mad that everything was running so late. She boiled down on the fly, yep. boiled down a 45 minute presentation to like eight minutes. Yep. And then, wow. you know, made kind of made a joke of it and saying, listen, I don't want to be the one holding you back from, yep. you know, being on time and being late. And so she was able to take it, flip it on a dime instead of getting stressed, yep. instead of getting hijacked, she used it as an opportunity and said, you know what? I'm going to be self-aware. I'm going to have empathy for the audience, yep. audience and then have that foresight to say, I'm going to use this to my advantage. Yep. Awesome. Absolutely awesome. Because you always knew that the the speaker that took the watch off and set it on the podium and said they had to watch their time mm -hmm. was the person that was going to go over. Yeah. Yep. And they were going to go over by a lot. And if you understand the audience and you understand the timing, mm -hmm. you realize that sometimes you have to take a 45 minute session and do it in like 15 minutes Condense to get you back it. on track. Right. Well, you have and to... when you can do that effectively, mm -hmm. People appreciate it. You yeah. have to read the audience. You have to feel, feel what is happening right. in, in the environment. Like a lot of people just, whatever's on their slides, whatever they've prepped for, whatever they've rehearsed. Like that's one mm -hmm. of the reasons I, I, I tend to not rehearse because I don't know what the flow is going to feel like. I don't know what the atmosphere is. Until you're in it. Until I'm in it. And yeah. I, want to, I want to be very cognizant of mm -hmm. reading the audience, very cognizant of what they need based on what the, the conference has provided prior, which I often don't have insight into. Yep. And then being able to provide that. And especially overseas, Matt, you were spot on. That overseas one, I use that, that mental... 
picture, uh, motion picture in my head. I really want to get in their head and understand what is the current events, what is different, like take my Western mind out of this, yep. understand where they're at and what I can actually provide that is a benefit to them, which is often not based around my topic it is the non-tangibles that you're providing to them the mm -hmm. the energy the optimism all of the things that people come away and it's not about really what you said it's about how you made them feel yeah and, and it's really not about you no you're there to serve yeah. you're speaking to a, that audience to serve different. the audience right and some people forget that yeah yep. some people forget you know they're they're there to they're be, there to, to learn to be on stage right. right no that's not why you're there you're not there to be on stage and be a presence you're there to teach people that means mm -hmm. you have to put your ego down that's 100 <laughs> yeah. percent. right and that's why i'm such a big fan of that servant leadership mentality yeah uh associated to that is the last article how to talk slower and clearer oh, god i'm so bad at that <laughs> no but I, th I think we do a pretty good job on the podcast yeah, yeah. right i mean Years we of have practice. Years of practice. <laughs> and really, again, back to self-awareness yeah. and, and how to slow it down. Pauses mm -hmm. are huge when you're doing a presentation. Let it sink into the audience, right? Back to this whole conversation. Like those pauses have huge impact when you're trying yeah. to get a point across. And allow the speaker to in, because in here is breathe. Yeah. And sometimes I watch some speakers who are like, they're almost out of breath yeah. when they're speaking because mm -hmm. it's just one big run on sentence or just one thing after another, after another, after another, and they don't pause. Yeah. I grew up here in New England. We just notoriously speak fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like in my DNA and it takes a lot of thought. It really takes a lot of thought to kind of slow it down and just breathe. But that goes to, to the empathy side. You want your audience to be able mm -hmm. to digest. You want mm -hmm. that nonverbal communication and that right. connection to happen. And yeah. Again, that that is something that is mm -hmm. is honed over the years, and and you can you can do it well, and you can do it poorly in the same day, mm -hmm. oftentimes just yeah. based on how you're feeling. So you really have to connect and make sure you're uh, very aware, self aware yep. of what you're doing and how you're presenting that, and understand why you're trying to present that. If you're really trying to connect with the audience, you have to focus at looking at the camera. You have to take a breath. You have to give that minute of mm -hmm. time for that nonverbal to to sink in, and that's. For, especially for tech people, we have a long ADHD run-on string <laughs> of thoughts that just has yeah. to come out. Right? It's very technical. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Right. And, and by the way, this took me years to master. Sure. Yes. Yeah, it took absolutely. me years to master. I went through so many uh, yeah. speech classes and really? trainings. and Some very expensive trainings. <laughs> yeah. But luckily, I, I did a lot of them when I was at RSA. Yeah. So it was great because they, they picked up the tab for a lot of it. Oh, wow. But yeah. because Art Coviello, who to me is one of the most masterful keynote speakers mm -hmm. I've, I've ever met, right? He was, he, there was something that was so important that if you were going to go out and speak in public yeah. and be part of the RSA brand, he wanted to make sure that we, we, we nailed it. Yeah, right. And, you're and representing so we, the brand. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we went through a lot of training when I was yeah, So if RSA. you're running a conference, definitely find, even if it's a free resource or someone mm -hmm. wants to donate time, that is a fantastic way to mm -hmm. mentor the next generation of speakers. Cause there are a lot of us that have spoken a lot. Yeah. But there is a whole generation that has very excellent knowledge, but they're either terrified of speaking, they're mm -hmm. not very good at speaking, yeah. or they need some mentoring and help. So right. always offer to review slides, to run through presentations. And if mm -hmm. you're running a conference, maybe offer the the option to have some public speaking uh, lessons from yeah. people that have done it. it I'll, I'll tell difference. you, one of, the, one of the biggest things I learned was, you know, CEO of mine way back when um, basically said, you know, if you're going to start public speaking, Learn a lot about yourself and know when you're about to get hijacked, right? When, when that lizard brain takes over, that <laughs> fight or flight takes over, yeah. kind of learn what that feels like. And then as soon as you can take that and kind of divert from it and calm yourself down, that takes away from some of that stage fright, right? Yeah. Because everybody gets the butterflies. Oh, Every, of course. Everybody. You're not human if you I get do. the butterflies. Oh my right? gosh. I used to sit in the, I would sit in the green room practicing and practicing mm -hmm. and practicing that's the other thing that art taught me was his preparation for his rsa keynotes and how much time he spent doing it you, i would you have can prepare <laughs> i would have butterflies mm -hmm. sitting in the green room but when i got on stage it all went away because i just i just knew it yeah like yep and, and it is the preparation that that makes that work yeah confidence Having confidence when you walk on a stage or walk on a walk up to a podium is oh, yeah. so important. And it it's, is. It's practice. It's a high performer. Like yep. you, you're yep. Tom Brady. You show up on the field. Like you're not going to be nervous. You know what you got to go do, and you just get to that zone. And, and that's right. 
deliver what you have to deliver because that's what people want to see. You're mm. delivering for someone else, not yourself. Yeah, he forgot that on Sunday. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Gentlemen, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for joining me in studio today. I know Tyler and I flew in last night to make this happen. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, and we'll see you next year on Business Security Weekly.